Well, we just finished the National Day of Prayer on Thursday where we come around this country in prayer. Uh, and if we ever needed prayer in this nation, it's now. We're in a lot of struggles right now. A lot of people that are hurting, especially single income fam families that are going through problems with the inflation and the gas and everything else that's going to affect it. And so we, uh, we're going to pray today, the supply chain problems, there's so many things going on in our families and our homes, and uh, we're going to raise that up to the Lord in prayer. So bow with me just a minute. Hey Lord, we just come before your throne of grace. What a privilege and an honor it is to be able to worship together freely. Um, so many countries, I think of China and Russia and different places that, that are kind of restricted on what they can pray, pray where they can go to worship. And, you know, you think of a place like North Korea and, and uh, Iraq and Iran and places in the Middle East and there are so many Christians around and, uh, that don't have that opportunity and have this beautiful church that you've given us and this people that you've given us that we can join together and raise our concerns for our nation and our families up to the Lord Jesus Christ. I always think about intercessory prayer, how important it is in my life. You know, it says in Hebrews that it required the Son to die in order for us to have the privilege to approach the throne of grace. Because at that time when Jesus died on the cross and he raised from the dead was the day that we were able to uh, raise our petition through Jesus Christ. He is our high priest to the Father in heaven, and he will listen to our prayers. There's no more sacrifice. The sacrifice has been paid on the cross. So that, again, is a great praise. The other great praise is that we have a, a country that is free, that we have a freedom to speak, we have a freedom to vote, we have a freedom uh, of so many things. We Today we pray for those people that probably are missing their mothers because they're on duty today. They might be first responders, they might be our police, they might be our, our EMS, they might be our firefighters, they might be so many. Then we have our military serving abroad to protect our freedoms here. So Lord, we have so many. We raise up today in prayer. Uh, we thank you for each family that's represented today in our church and that are watching online that think that uh, worshiping God is so important in their life that they'll take this time out of their day to do that. Lord, we just uh, pray today that you would be with those that we inflicted with uh, uh, sickness, whatever kind of sickness it is, and uh, mothers and fathers that are hurting because their families are in that situation. But we know that there's so many people praying, we can have rest in that. And we know we have a Father in heaven that hears every prayer. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this day, this wonderful Mother's Day. Thank you, Lord, for the mothers that uh, we've had in our family and grandmothers that have been an influence in our life to raise us in such a way that we would know God. We ask all this in Christ's precious name and all God's people said, Amen. Let us stand once more and sing Sunlight. Thankful for the beautiful sunlight today on Mother's Day. <clears throat>
seated. I'm going to sing a song for you today called Certain Women. song. I just love that song. Isn't that a great song? It's a wonderful song. But, you know, today we celebrate Mother's Day and, and uh, as Sandy sang that beautiful song written by Shauna Edwards, Certain Women. Uh, that's what I entitled my message today. That's what we're going to look in Scripture with. And uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, we're going to look at that together. Uh, so if you go to uh, Luke chapter 8, that's where we're going to start our scripture. So I'll give you a minute to get there. We're going to look at Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read from the New King James Version, so if you want to follow along, you can. And uh, we'll get this started. You can also look at the screen if you can read it all right. It says, Now it came to pass, 
afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. Uh, John MacArthur, in his book, Twelve Extraordinary Women, wrote, There was certainly nothing inappropriate about Jesus' practice of allowing women disciples to be his followers. These were godly women who devoted their whole lives to spiritual things. They evidently had no uh, family responsibilities that required them to stay at home. Luke said Mary Magdalene and the other women were among many who provided for him from their substance. The fact that her, Mary Magdalene, appears the head of the list of this band of women seems to indicate, indicate that she had a special place of respect among them. Some of these women were mothers who struggled to bring up their children in a broken and fragile world. The Israelite nation was enslaved by Rome with the burden of heavy taxes. To make things even worse, their own Jewish leaders were corrupt in dealing with the people by taxing them with over-exuberant laws and imposing more unnecessary taxes. These certain women were all waiting for the promised Messiah to rescue them. Could this be him? These women, these mothers were empty nesters now. The children were grown and on their own. Could this Jesus be the Messiah, the promised one, to bring hope to their children and their children's children? I love this scripture found in Luke chapter 4. Jesus comes to Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. As it was a custom, Jesus went into the synagogue. On the Sabbath day, he stood up to read the scripture. And he read these words from the prophet Isaiah as a scroll was handed to him by the temple attendant. So listen to these words in Luke 4, 18, starting for Luke 4, starting at verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I wonder if any of those certain women were in attendance that day when the Lord read this scripture of promise and fulfillment. These were the women that experienced Jesus' ministry firsthand. Can you imagine that? Walking with Jesus? Some were healed by, from infirmities. One of these women is Mary of Magdala in Galilee, also widely known as Mary Magdalene. John MacArthur writes, Mary Magdalene is one of the best known and least understood names in Scripture. Scripture deliberately draws a curtain of silence over much of her life and personal background. But she still emerges as one of the prominent women of the New Testament. She is mentioned by name in all four Gospels mostly in connection with the events of Jesus' crucifixion. She has the eternal distinction of being the first person to whom Christ revealed himself after the resurrection. Mark 16, 9 reflects, Mary was indeed a woman whom Christ had liberated from demonic bondage. How and when she was delivered is never spelled out, for us, but Christ set her free, and she was free indeed. 
Having been set free from the demons and from sin, she became a slave to righteousness. Her life was not merely reformed, it was utterly transformed. Mary Magdalene remained Jesus' faithful dis disciple even when others forsook him. When others walked no longer with him, she remained faithful. She followed him all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem for the final Passover celebration. She ended up loyally following him to the cross and even beyond. John 6, 66, John 6, verse 66 is the hardest verse in the Bible I have ever read. It simply reads, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. This verse appears after Jesus had just fed a multitude of 5,000, not counting the women and children that were in attendance that day. Many followed Jesus to stand on the sidelines, being a fan, never a player, standing on the sidelines to see and the experience of, and experienced miracles. They were always there for the free food and the miracles, but when Jesus told them about what would soon take place, many turned back and no longer walked with him. Always a fan, never a participant. But Mary was a participant. She stayed and walked the walk and talked the talk when many others departed. John MacArthur writes, Matthew, Mark, and John all record that Mary Magdalene was present at the crucifixion. Combining all the three accounts, she stood with Mary, the mother of Jesus, Salome, mother of the apostles James and John, and another lesser known Mary, mother of James the Less and Joseph. At the start of the crucifixion, the remaining true believers stood at the foot of the cross, but Matthew and Mark describes the end of the ordeal, said the women were looking on from afar. As the crucifixion wore on, crowds of taunting miscreants moved in, elbowing the women back. The women probably drew back instinctively, too, as the scene became steadily more and more gruesome. It was as if they could not bear to watch but they could not bear to leave. The writer of Luke describes it this way. And the whole crowd, this is from Luke 23, 48 and 49, and the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were the only women that stayed till the end. They, they secretly followed Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea and Nicodemus to the tomb and observed where he was laid. Let's turn for a moment, and this is kind of good right after Easter, to go to uh, John chapter 20. So I'll give you a minute to get there. We're going to read John chapter 20. I'm going to read from the NIV version if you'd like to follow along. Uh, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, 
But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot, they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? <laughs> Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around, or turned toward her, him, and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless the reading of this scripture. Well, Ken Geyer is one of my favorite writers, and he paraphrases, paraphrases this event in uh, an intimate moment with Mary Magdalene. Listen to what he says. It was in a garden ages ago that paradise was lost, and it is in a garden now that it would be regained. But Mary Magdalene doesn't know that. For here the hobnail boot of the Roman Empire has crushed her hope, and grounded in the dirt with its iron heel. Her hope was Jesus. He had changed her life, and she had followed him ever since. He had cast seven demons out of her, freeing her from untold torment. He had given her life, a reason to live, a piece of the kingdom. He had given her worth and dignity, understanding, compassion, love. And he had given her hope. Now that hope lies at the bottom of her heart, flat and lifeless. But something helps her survive the cruel boot. Something resilient, like a blade of grass that springs up after it's stepped on. That something is love. Love brought Mary to, G to the cross. And love brought her now to his grave. But as she wends her way along the dark garden path, she stumbles upon a chilling sight. The stone has been rolled away. The tomb has been violated. Just when she thinks life couldn't get worse, it gets worse. The night gets darker, her hope dimmer. Now even a pinpoint of starlight shines for her now. Not even a pinpoint of starlight shines for her now. As she runs to tell the disciples, a legion of questions haunt her. Who took the body? The Roman government? The religious leaders? And why? What would they want with it? Have they given him a criminal's burial by dumping him outside the city in the garbage fires of the Valley of the Gehenna? Have they put him on display to further mock him? She finds Peter and John in breathless fragments, reports what she saw. They rip through the night on a ragged foot race to the tomb. Mary tries to follow, but her side is splitting. She will catch up, she tells herself, when she catches her breath. His lungs burning, Peter stoops into the caved entrance. The wings of the dove gray dawn have extended a soft feather of light into the cave. As his eyes adjust, he takes careful notice of the burial wrappings made rigid by the resin from the spices. The linen cocoon lays intact on the stone slab, intact but hollow. Doubt and faith intermingle their minds, bewildering them as they slowly walk away. Mary is left behind, her only uh, tears her only companion. She takes those tears with her as she enters the tomb 
to take a look for herself. And suddenly the woman who was once possessed with demons finds herself in the presence of angels. One stands at the head of the stone slab, the other at the foot, like the Ark of the Covenant in the most, highly, high, most holy place at the tabernacle. Cherubim on either end, for this too is the most holy place. She is despondent as she tells the reason for her tears. Then from behind another voice reaches out to her. Woman, why are you crying? She wheels around. Maybe the morning is foggy. Maybe tears blur her eyes. Maybe Jesus is the last person she expects to see. Whatever the case, she doesn't recognize him. That is until Mary. She blinks away the tears and can hardly believe her eyes. Master, overwhelmed, she throws her arms around the Lord she loves so much. She had been there when he suffered on, at the cross. Now he is there when she is suffering. She had stood by him in the darkest hour. Now he is standing by her and hers. He had seen her tears. Now he is there to wipe them away. Jesus interrupts the embrace to send her a great commission to tell the disciples the good news. He is risen. I have seen him. I have touched him. He is alive. And so too is her hope. In his triumph, Jesus could have paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. He could have knocked on Pilate's door. He could have confronted the high priest. The, but the first person the resurrected Lord appears to is a woman without hope. And the first word he speaks are, why are you crying? What a savior we serve, or rather who serves us. For in his hour of greatest triumph, he doesn't shout his victory from rooftops. He comes quietly to a woman who grieves, who desperately needs to hear his voice see his face, and feel his embrace. Let me close this message with an excerpt of another Ken Dyer's divine embrace as the Lord invites us to dance to a dance of a lifetime. Close your eyes and listen to the emperor's waltz and allow yourself to be swept away. I don't know if you ever heard the emperor's waltz, but it's by Johann Strauss. Beautiful, beautiful song. But when the waltz is over, Pause to catch your breath, then relive the, relive the experience. What were you feeling during the dance? Excited that you were on the dance floor? Honored that Jesus picked you to be his partner? Ennobled by the dignity of the dance? Confused at places? Uncertain of your next step? Out of breath? At the pace? A little dizzy? Afraid you might trip and fall? Embarrassed that you stepped on his toes, exhilarated when it was over. All of these feelings you will experience in the course of following Christ. It's natural to feel uncertain about the dance you have never done before. It's natural to be fearful, even hesitant. Dance lessons would help, wouldn't they? But maybe it's not so much lessons. In dancing, we need as lessons in loving. Because the Christian life is about intimacy, not technique. The Lord of the dance doesn't want us, want us worrying about our feet. He doesn't want us wondering about the steps ahead. He merely wants us to feel the music, fall into his arms, and follow his lead. There are places he wants to take us on the dance floor, things he wants to show us, feelings he wants to share with us, words. He wants to whisper in our ear, this is what divine embrace is, an invitation to a more intimate relationship with Christ, one exhilarating, ennobling, uncertain step at a time. We have a choice, you and I. It's a choice we make every day throughout the day. The choice is this, we can dance or we can sit it out. If we dance, we may step on his toes, and he may step on ours. We may stumble and bump into other people. 
We may fall on our faces and make fools of ourselves. People may talk. They may avoid us. They may even ridicule us. If you fear those things, you may want to sit it out. If you do, you won't have to worry. You'll be safe in your seat along the wall. You'll also miss the dance. More importantly, you'll miss the romance. At some time or other, I have chosen to sit it out. Fear was a big reason. Fear of the attention it would bring, and perhaps the criticism. Fear of embarrassment and possible estrangement. Fear of not being in control of my life, my career, my future. Fear of being led to places that would be uncomfortable, even painful. There are two things I have learned from the divine embrace. That perfect love casts out fear and that I would rather dance poorly with Jesus than sit perfectly with anyone else. What about you? Are you going to remain a wallflower or join in the dance of a lifetime? The choice is yours. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just come before your presence today. We think of Mary Magdalene and all those certain women. They had to make that step of grace to follow Jesus. And it, co it was a costly uh, to follow him. I can't imagine what it must have been for Mary Magdalene and the rest as they sat at the bottom of the cross, as they had walked with the Savior so many years to see him in such pain and suffering. And they had to be pushed back because they couldn't stand to look at it. So they looked from afar, but they never gave up. They followed him all the way. Lord, today we just think that it is going to be hard. We don't want to look at the cross. We don't want to bear a cross. We don't want to carry a cross. We want, all, we want this magic wish list that God's going to answer what we want. It's not about him submitting to our will, but us submitting to his will. He will answer our prayer, but he wants to do the most perfect thing in order to do it. It's for us to trust him enough to say, Lord, I surrender to you today. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my all. A beautiful song, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Lord, let us today, you know, maybe we're holding on to things. They are precious to us. Let us drop it at the cross of Christ. Let us turn 180 degrees away from the cross and follow him all the way, wherever he would lead. I know some of the roads are going to be uneven. Some of them will be uncertain. Some will be, un will be winding. Some of them will be hard. We might stumble in the path. We might do things that that are very uncomfortable. But Lord, we know that we all we want is to have that intimate relationship with you. You don't want us to be religious. Anybody can be religious. You want us to be intimate, to have a relationship with you. Now I pray for anybody here today that might not know you as that, that they would make that decision of faith. And maybe those that are watching on YouTube or Facebook or would have that opportunity to make that decision. But Lord, today we give you this Mother's Day to you and every day of our life. And we'll give you the praise in Christ's precious name. Amen. We're going to sing our final song, Because He Lives. So please stand and join me as we sing this together. Click it one more time, Marianne. There it is. <laughs> God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He by my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lived because he lived 
Jesus, I'm just so thankful that we have that promise. Just like Mary Magdalene, she finally found her hope in a grave. We find our hope in you. And Lord, we just trust you in everything that we do and say that your will is always the best choice. And we surrender to you today. Uh, thank you again for these wonderful mothers. And we'll give you the praise and glory that's due your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen.